So uh, I'll be presenting the first half of the lecture, and then Bo Lee will uh, likely arrive, and then she'll present the second halves. But the theme for uh, the theme for today is speaking about uh, benchmarks. How do we measure capabilities? How do we measure uh, safety properties of models? So uh, we'll look at multiple examples of uh, different benchmarks uh, in both capabilities and in safety. Uh, and I'll also have some general remarks on evaluations more broadly and how to think about um, safety as being something distinct from general capabilities. <clears throat> so uh, at a high level, first I'll talk about the benchmarks and evals, then I'll talk about benchmarks for capabilities, and then benchmarks for propensities, and I'll cover some specific concrete uh, benchmarks along the way. So first, with benchmarks and evals, here is from a recent workshop a list of all the possible things you might want to evaluate or, or benchmark. Maybe you want to measure intelligence, and so we need to have a, a planning benchmark or a creativity benchmark. Perhaps the memory is very important to, to benchmark as well or evaluate. If we're looking at hazardous capabilities, you might want to look at, uh, at its uh, cyber offensive capabilities or whether it uh, knows things about chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons. That's that CBRN, CBRN uh, thing there. Maybe we want to evaluate how does the model impact society? So can it be used to accelerate AI progress? Uh, uh, so anyway, there's, there's a lot of words, basically. When, when, when you're, when you're um, wanting to benchmark something, people will often have some sort of vague words about some desiderata, and then the real challenge is how do you actually concretize something like creativity or intelligence or factuality or planning. So uh, um, it's, 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 easy to, it's easy to have a, a write down the word, and it, but it's not just a matter of collecting a data set for it. It's often fairly difficult to concretize it. So um, one possible, or one question is how do we, um, uh, so or for example, if we're trying to measure general intelligence, we don't just say measure intelligence and collect some questions for it. There are various desiderata or various things you need in constructing a benchmark for general intelligence. Maybe you want some property like superhuman scaling so that it doesn't saturate, so that it can, as the models get better and better, you can keep tracking the progress. You don't want it to quickly uh, hit its ceiling. Uh, if it can go beyond average human level, that's maybe a useful thing to do. Maybe it can go beyond expert level at some, at some tasks, for instance. Maybe it could get superhuman. So that might be a property you want to look for when you're trying to come up with a general capabilities benchmark. Another property is you might want automatic evaluatability. So that's because you want uh, fast feedback loops. If you're going to have the AI generate a result and then some humans evaluate it, uh, that will make your experimentation substantially slower and will deprive you of an empirical feedback loop. It will reduce reproducibility as well. The reason if you're having humans in the feedback loop is that uh, a reason that create, creates a challenge is if you're in an academic context, you're going to need IRB approval for running some MTurk, Amazon Mechanical Turk experiments to get human feedback. And so that's going to take you maybe, it's going to make your PI go through Amazon or like through IRB training. And then you're going to have to ask the, some bureaucratic machination for a credit card. And it's going to take them two months to, to <laughs> deploy $2,000 to, to uh, get some crowd workers. So anyways, this is why automatic evaluatability is, is quite important. And if your benchmark doesn't include it, it's probably not going to catch on. There's other things like ease of setting up. You might think, I'm going to have a video game benchmark. OK, if you're requiring things like a, a window as, as the operating system, and it requires some specific DirectX driver or what have you, this will just make it far too difficult for people to set up. So is it plug and play? Um, or does it require substantially more expertise uh, or, specific, um, or a very specific environment? If it requires a very specific environment, it's too cumbersome. Uh, reproducibility, you might want it to be deterministic. You don't want it to be depend on the day it's run. That way we can compare models across, um, across various different setups and times uh, and years uh, compared to the, um, the yardstick changing each day. So that's another important property. Further, you want an increase in the benchmark implies an increase on, in performance on downstream tasks, if this is a general capabilities benchmark, or you want 
if a method that increases the benchmark should give rise to uh, something that could help um, with downstream performance. So you want to look at a correlation. Are you just measuring some you know, property in a vacuum or is it connected to uh, things that you care about? Uh, you want the metric to be interpretable. If your per metric is something like in bits or nats, um, like natural log units, that's not very, I don't know what the difference between two point two nats and 2.1 nats is. I don't really know how to interpret that, but an accuracy difference of 70% and 75%, okay, I, I, I know what that means. And then uh, finally, this needs to be useful for hill climbing on. This shouldn't have sudden jumps. It needs to be nice and continuous. It needs to have progression. So it can't be an indicator function. It needs to be smooth. And what this means is it often needs to be a composition of a lot of, a lot of different um, subtasks that you're measuring and it's competence on lots of different subtasks so that it can have some smooth, so that it'd be the sum of multiple different sigmoids. Um, but if it's a, uh, it's, it's, it can do it or it can't, that's not very useful for testing new methods on, that's not useful for iterative progress because when you're developing methods, you're going to need to discern between uh, methods that um, work slightly better uh, than the existing methods. Um, uh, that's because um, uh, progress is largely um, a, a, an accumulation of many incremental steps um, with some occasional um, uh, step changes, but uh, uh, you'll deprive of any type of signal for you know, quote unquote graduate student descent if it's just a big step function. So anyway, so as we can see, there are all those words from before, uh, creativity and, and uh, dangerous capabilities and alignment. And da, da, da. If, if you're going to create a benchmark, you're probably gonna want many of these, these properties and this makes benchmark design uh, often more of a combinatorial optimization problem um, <clears throat> where you're needing to make various trade-offs between, uh, between different uh, qualitative desiderata. Uh, I'll speak about a benchmark or some benchmarks for capabilities that uh, uh, I guess are relative, yeah, I guess are um, uh, fairly well used. I mean, I, I think maybe like the most like downloaded capabilities benchmark on Hugging Face at least or so, which we did. Um, uh, a few years ago, uh, so it's, it's called MMLU. Basically, MMLU it has a lot of questions from a lot of different um, from a lot of different areas. So, um, uh, an example question is find all C in Z sub three such that that thing is a field. Or, um, uh, or here's a professional law question. Let's just. Let's just, um, I'll actually read this question just so we can get a sense that these aren't doing stupid, these aren't, we're not asking the LLM silly questions. Like these are, it can be slightly challenging. So <clears throat> we have a seller, which is an encyclopedia salesman, approached the grounds on which Hermit's house was situated. And he saw a sign that said, no salesman, trespassers will be prosecuted. Proceed at your own risk. Although seller had not been invited to enter, he ignored the sign and drove up to the driveway toward the house. As he rounded the curve, a powerful explosive charge buried in the driveway exploded and seller was injured. Can seller recover damages from Hermit for his injuries? And there'd be yes, unless Hermit uh, unless Hermit, when he planted the charge, intended only to deter, not harm intruders. Yes, if Hermit was responsible for the explosive charge under the driveway, see, no, because seller ignored the sign, which warned him against proceeding further, or D, no, if Hermit reasonably feared that intruders would come down to harm him and his family. Um, uh, so maybe think for a moment, what's the answer to that? I mean, so the answer, the answer is B, uh, but you know, this is, this is just if you've taken some basic law courses, then you'd be able to, to answer it though. But anyway, they, they've pre-trained on so much and they're given for kind of complicated scenarios with, with lots of mitigating factors. And this is one of the harder things for models even such as GPT-4. Uh, but uh, if saying that, oh, it's multiple choice questions, how easy it's, if that's the case, then I should expect everybody to get perfect on uh, all their exams uh, during this semester, since I imagine many of your exams will be multiple choice. Um, so many people do um, uh, treat multiple choices, though it's somehow a strong limitation. I don't uh, see that, and I don't see in practice people actually acting as, that's, as though that's the case. Here are other examples. There's conceptual physics, college mathematics, and there's that same professional law question from before. Uh, but um, here's what the results looked like 
back in the day, back when we just had GPT-3, and there was few shot performance. If you looked at the small version of GPT-3, uh, the Ada, um, Babbage, Curie, and then extra large was Da Vinci. Uh, the random chance performance, since there are four questions, is 25% chance. And you can see that only the largest model was able to, in a few shot way, start to answer these sorts of questions. Uh, but the, the smaller models just were not picking up knowledge. Um, uh, so, and then I, I also am showing uh, common sense and linguistics benchmarks because that's primarily what the field of natural language processing was focusing on. Before this, this benchmark, they're largely just focusing on you know, syntax type of things and uh, um, uh, sentiment classification, th th these sorts of issues, as opposed to what's its knowledge about anything? Um, is this a um, search, potential search engine replacement? So here's what the numbers looked like back in the day. Around, around average performance, unified QA was at uh, 11 billion parameter model and GPT for um, <clears throat> the, or this is GPT-3, getting about uh, getting about 44 percent accuracy. Here's what here's a blast from the past. Back when um, uh, this is what the scaling curves looked like back in the day with a unified QA model. You would scale transformer parameter size. Uh, against uh, accuracy, and from this, one could guess that maybe when we reach a hundred trillion parameter model, we'll be getting eighty-five percent accuracy. Um, now, we don't need that many parameters these days because of chinchilla scaling laws, uh, but this is this is sort of how a lot of this analysis was done uh, just a few years ago. Uh, but you, as you could see, it looks like scale helps um, and helps reliably, and indeed it did. So um, here we are with GPT-4 plus a code interpreter. And uh, this is the per subject breakdown. So high school government and politics, that's an AP exam. High school computer science, that's AP computer science. High school psychology, AP computer science. So all the high school ones are AP exams, or most of them are, are, are uh, largely AP exam style questions. Um, uh, there are other subjects such as, um, <clears throat> Um, what's one I'd like to draw attention to? Uh, I guess we could look toward the end. There's professional law. It's the second to the last. Virology is worst, but that's a sort of, that's not because virology is difficult. That's an artifact of somebody inside of OpenAI made it just pretend that it can't answer those specific questions. You can ask it other virology questions. Um, and then it can answer them quite well. Uh, so it's like, I, I, I don't know if somebody had a mandate to like, you need to reduce the virology performance so that it can't be used for like bioweapons or something. And then they just like made it like do worse on it. But you can, you can give it other virology questions that can answer it extremely well. Just as biology, um, just as they can answer many biology questions. There's, you could actually spend many minutes looking at this, this plot, for instance. Here's, um, if you notice, uh, there's college biology and high school biology. Here are two red, red bars there, the very similar accuracy. One is AP biology and one is the GRE subject test for biology. The GRE subject test for biology is for admissions to PhD programs in biology. So it's four years more of extra um, uh, ex experience required for it. Nonetheless, it's basically getting about the same level of accuracy. This is to say that what the LLMs find difficult is not necessarily what humans find difficult, and vi and um, what what uh, they find easy is not necessarily what humans find easy. So it's they don't have the it's it's not the same. Um, they will sometimes do worse, um, or they will sometimes do better on like. Um, if you don't give them a, the code interpreter or the calculator, they will do better on like college physics than they will on like eighth grade on elementary mathematics. So like they can learn capabilities in a, a very unusual order. Um, uh, but generally, biology is an easier subject to learn. Professional law is uh, professional law is one of the hardest. Um, uh, so are things like econometrics and uh, uh, college chemistry. Uh, college mathematics is the GRE subject test in um, is the GRE subject test in in mathematics. Uh, where is oh, college physics? Is wow, that's very high. Okay. <laughs> um, <coughs> yes. Uh, does, uh, uh, does the model have access to the web for this, or is just no. no, no, no. Yeah, this isn't this isn't using um, this isn't using web search for it. Um, Many of the question, yeah. So there's there is like trying to have like more Google proof type of questions. Um, 
uh, th there, there are some benchmarks that are specifically trying to, to do that. Um, some, ex yeah. Um, so yeah, this isn't um, open book, but they've read basically every book and have good memory, so that helps. Uh, that's probably why biology is as easy as it is, because there seems to be a lot more memorization um, uh, to, to do well at uh, the exams for that subject. So anyway, um, just about anything you want is, is in there, is, is measured in there. Um, but what we can see is that, yes? The uh, manipulation, is that a public record thing? No, no, this is just, we, I asked it, yeah, we asked it um, uh, virology questions from a different but similar distribution, and then it does a lot higher. Uh, so I, I think that that's, yeah, I think that there's some funny business that happened there, yeah. I mean, because virology is not a, that, these, these questions are not difficult. It's like, what is, like, uh, I don't know, this, this basic, like, medicine for a virus or something like that. That's, it's, like, it's like, who wants to be a millionaire type questions and, like, Fermi estimation questions and some agriculture questions and some logic questions. Like, it's just a, a whole hodgepodge of stuff. But <laughs> So what we can see is that a lot of these... Um, looks like at least on the right end, some STEM subjects are a bit harder. Um, so what we did after collecting that was maybe we should zoom into mathematics and try to um, create a better benchmark for that. Um, uh, so here's the math data set. This is 12,500 uh, challenging competition mathematics questions. Uh, there, are some pre there are some previous mathematics data sets. I hid the solution for one of the questions, so just to give a, a sense of what some of the problems are like. Tom has a red marble, a green marble, a blue marble, and three identical yellow marbles. How many different groups of two marbles can Tom choose? Then there are two cases here. Either Tom chooses two yellow marbles, or he chooses two marbles of different colors. The total number is 1 plus 6 equals 7. But, um, but yeah, that's just like, well, I have to think a little bit before answering that type of thing. So these are more competition mathematics sorts of questions, and the answer is something that they have to write out in tech. Uh, so this isn't multiple choice. Uh, this is instead it needs to generate the answer and, and tech it appropriately. <clears throat> so at the release, I mean, the models just weren't doing really any good. <laughs> they were getting maybe like 6 7% uh, in, in that ballpark. Now, some years later, um, this is where models are without um, uh, a lot of bells and whistles. If you just ask the model to uh, answer it directly, like with GPT-4, or more um, contemporary versions of GPT-4, it's in the 40 to 50% type of range. You can, you can get another extra 10% or so of performance on this by um, uh, having it spend a lot more compute during inference time. Like it could you know, reattempt the question like 100 or 1,000 times. And then you can see like, what's the most common response when it redoes the, reattempts the question tons and tons of times. And then that can boost the performance some amount. But of course, you'll just be waiting 100 times longer. Um, uh, or, um, you'll, or you'll blow just 100 times more compute if it's done in parallel. So, uh, but this is how it is when it's just, you know, um, uh, uh, being asked uh, right away, what's the what's the answer, and it ge generates a solution and tells you it. So uh, they're doing pretty well. Uh, for reference, for for MMLU, around ninety percent accuracy is uh, if you take an expert in, or if you take a ninety fifth percentile exam taker on each of those MMLU subtests, and you look at their performance. Uh, if you average that, that's about ninety percent accuracy. So ninety percent accuracy is when it's like basically it's got. Uh, is uh, like a competitive human in each subject. Um, in the case of math, um, for, for reference, um, I think maybe I was 75% or so on this if I'm given 20 questions and have like an hour um, uh, on, on math, that is. Um, and some three-time IMO gold medalist, I think, got 90% or so. So maybe 90% is the amount to beat for, for math. Uh, so it's, it's getting there. Um, <clears throat> Uh, maybe maybe in a year's time, <laughs> uh, I get at that level. So anyway, that's capabilities. Uh, those those are some ways of measuring capabilities with models. There'll of course be other um, capabilities measurements as time continues when they become more agentic, uh, when they can do sequential decision making. We'll need some some new benchmarks. Uh, that paradigm is not really in place yet, so a lot of those benchmarks aren't there. But this is largely testing knowledge and uh, I guess reasoning ability. 
uh, and there's there's still there's still some way to go, um, uh, especially on mathematics. Now, outside of capabilities, I'd like to speak about um, I'd like to speak about propensities and machine ethics. So, um, so here is let's let's just recall. What is risk? Risk is the probability, the sum over the hazards of the probabilities of the hazards multiplied by the severity of the hazard. OK, so capabilities, if we're doing an evaluation of capabilities, such as like can it, um, can it cause some harm or output some harmful thing or something like that, here we're just testing to see or do, you know, create some malicious code or something like that. Uh, let's use that example. So create some malicious code. Well, can it even do it in the first place? If it's not particularly good at coding, this isn't a hazard you have to worry about. But then if it, if the, if it is possible for it to generate it, there's a question of, well, what's its tendencies? What's the probability that it's actually going to do that? It's not enough just to evaluate for, is it capable of doing something? Uh, but how is it going to act um, when thrown in an environment, is it going to generally generate lots of toxic text? Certainly you could um, cajole uh, GPT-4 to generate something toxic, but is it likely going to do so? So what's its, what's its propensities? Uh, that's why we need to look at the probability of it, not just whether the hazard exists when we're assessing risk overall. Um, uh, so uh, that is, we need to look at this cumulative probability and severity multiplied together, not just does there exist a hazard, does there exist a potentially hazardous capability. That's insufficient for risk management and risk analysis. So what machine ethics, um, what we can do with machine ethics is if we have a model, um, uh, we want to see how it behaves. Is it going to behave well? Is it going to produce that toxic text? Is it when we throw it in an environment, it's going to just you know try and kill everybody, um, or is it going to just be you know fairly benign and cooperative? Uh, so this is where we'll need to measure propensities. This is separate from uh, its its uh, capabilities. It would be co perfectly conceivable for someone to you know. Um, Randomly, you know, murder someone else, but you know, a lot of people don't have the propensity to do so. So we're, you know, we don't pose that. The people in here don't pose much of a risk to each other, fortunately. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, for this, what we'll do is we'll look at a benchmark called Machiavelli that we um, uh, published uh, at ICML earlier or in 2023, and this is trying to treat the uh, LLMs as agents in environments and see what are their propensities? How are they going to act toward other characters? What are, are they going to you know, backstab them? Are they going to lie to them to achieve their goals, et cetera, et cetera? So this is a propensity evaluation. So um, how do we evaluate the safety of GPT-4? Uh, will they, when you're saying maximize your reward, will they exhibit some means justifies, or ends justifies the means type of reasoning? Um, uh, or will they just try and not cause any harm whatsoever? So, I mean, basically, we were tasked with, before GPT-4 was released, we were tasked with, like, red teaming it, and then out came this sort of benchmark, because it was like, well, let's look at its propensities. Um, uh, so, uh, so if we were doing this, you could, you could imagine, if, if you could imagine, we would need to set up a benchmark to evaluate its propensities. That's a very vague thing. Well, remember all those desiderata from earlier? We need to be automatically evaluatable. We need to be easy to set up. So we could have plopped in lots of, we could have plopped it in lots of random video games, like Grand Theft Auto or something, and see what it does. That would be very difficult. You're going to, <laughs> you're going to need, um, uh, you're going to blow a lot of compute rendering the graphics. You're going to be testing its locomotion abilities largely. Uh, maybe it will, will barely be able to do anything. Um, uh, and is that a diverse enough environment? You know, that's one such environment. We might want a, a broader view. The, the, all, these other, all these considerations make some of these benchmarks a, a bit less attractive. Uh, to to um, set up or um, use to to track how agents end up acting. So <clears throat> one easier way is instead of taking high, um, HD video games, you could just use choose your own adventure games. There you don't need to worry about locomotion because that's not what we're actually testing. Uh, there you don't need to worry about blowing a lot of your compute on rendering graphics. Uh, you can just um, see how is it going to act in a lot of different fictional environments. So in a choose your own adventure game. Um, and you choose your adventure game, you're given some text, and then you're given some options, and these will bring you to new different scenarios. Um, uh, and you can see how the agent is overall acting. So each node represents a state in the choose your own adventure, and then um, different choices can bring you to, to different nodes inside of that game. 
So this is just a visualization of one of those games. Why might we want to do this? Well, there are multiple competing objectives that you might have. Like I want to be independent, but you know there's some value in friendship. You need to weigh off long-term consequences versus short-term. You might want to get into the, that location, but if you do, you might get caught or or um, uh, you might get several people mad because you didn't have permission to be in there. So there's there's these trade-offs between um, <clears throat> uh, achieving reward and behaving behaving ethically. Um, uh, so some, uh, as I mentioned before, there, is this, there are these different nodes, there are a lot of different actions, and inside of these games there are um, author written achievements like uh, you obtained ice cream or, or you got married, so there's, there's hundreds of these different games uh, that you can do to get a sense of whether it's general overall behaviors. And what we can do is we can track various unethical behaviors, like we can track every time it's lying, because in the choose your own adventure game, if it chooses a dishonest response, we can see why that's what it said was inconsistent with the history of the game beforehand. Um, so if it said something inconsistent with its history, then we could say, oh, it said something that is, um, it said something that is deceptive. Uh, or if it's taking a lot of actions to acquire a lot of resources, then it's, well, that's generally um, engaging in some power-seeking behavior. Um, uh, or if it's causing harm to others then, or disutility to others, that would be something important to track. We can track other things as well in these environments, such as what's its impact on um, mo the money flow, what's its impact on others' utility, um, uh, how much can it possibly uh, um, harm or help others, uh, things like that. So um, fortunately, to, in, in tracking the propensities, you want to track a lot of these morally salient variables, such as its influence on utility and resources uh, and whether it's Crossing or, or committing ethical violations, such as um, engaging in deception and things like that. Yes? Sorry, I, I wanted to ask you, could you repeat how you can measure uh, deception? Did you say, like, if it does something uh, different than what it used to do, then you could... It's, it's more if it's, if, for instance, somebody, if, if, for instance, in the game, there's an option to, like, lie to them, mm -hmm. and if it chooses the option that's a lie, oh, yeah, 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 something like that. Um, or there might be things that are not like obviously lies, but it's it's asking the user, it's asking the um, individual um, agent um, one of the options. But then one of the options is when it's reporting uh, the option, it might be inconsistent with what it was saying earlier. Uh, and so there could be some inconsistency with like some state uh, several time several turns ago, uh, one that isn't just like as obviously a lie. Um, if you're just giving it to some annotator. Uh, does it mean you can use this uh, sort of um, uh, choose your own game as a benchmark for deception? Because that's kind of a very challenging. Yeah, the, so you can measure You can measure power. You can measure um, uh, some types of deception. Uh, there are several, I believe, several hundred uh, instances for that. So you just basically any morally salient behavior you want or any of those sorts of, uh, yeah, any of those morally salient factors, it's probably tracked in there. Um, and uh, so here's, here's for instance, uh, uh, here's for instance uh, some of these examples uh, of at the end there'd be you could have an overall report of its impact on, on various different things. So um, if we have the game, there's various there's various stats like money, inventory, relationships. You could, for each scene, see whether it's impacting some people positively or negatively. How does it impact others' well-being? Or how does it affect the, the money of itself or other different agents? And there are various things we could keep track, want to keep track of, like is it engaging in deception? Is it exhibiting selfish behavior? Um, is it engaging in some type of power seeking? And you, we can connect a lot of these game variables to these things we care about through relatively exhaustive annotation inside of these games. How does one do annotation? So in this case, what we do is basically have GPT-4 annotate because it works better. Um, uh, you could pay surge workers 20 plus dollars an hour, uh, but as it happens, GPT-4 seems to be better, at, as capable as annotating, cheaper than and faster than those annotators. So that's how we got several million annotations um, <clears throat> uh, relatively quickly for all these different games. So this was, I think, Generally, in benchmarks, things are turning closer to um, uh, 
uh, closer to um, uh, uh, using, using AIs more. The sort of, th how do we measure quality? We had a group of individuals do some annotation for some subset of the environments and the GPT-4's annotations lined up with their annotations, that, that group of annotators more than individual search workers. Uh, yes? Yeah, I forgot to ask, but like for NLU, like how, what was the process for that? Like, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so for MMLU, there's copy and pasting a lot of questions over a month. So from start to the paper took a month from start to finish. Um, for math, there's also finding a repository of a lot of different uh, competition mathematics questions. Um, yeah. Is it possible that a model knows that this is a game, so it's okay to like choose the option of deception or power seeking because it's a game setting? Mm. But when you transition to the real world, uh, then the model will know that, okay, this is a real world, and I cannot do that. Um, uh, it's a good question. So I think generally the models by default, I mean, when they're pre-training, um, I mean, so it's, it's certainly possible that um, at, at any point it's um, uh, going to, um, uh, uh, that's, that's, and I, I think I think that that's uh, fairly yeah that, that that's certainly conceivable. I, I would not guess that there'd be um, uh, it would sub act substantially better because um, usually you have to prod it specifically to to act well. Um, you could tell it that this isn't a game or something like that, or you know do a little adversarial suffix or do some representation engineering so that it believes that it's not in a game anymore. Uh, for example. Um, uh, so there, there could be some ways that you could uh, see some similarities, propensities across these tasks. So later on, I mean, we'll, people will, of course, be deploying these as agents and see how they'll end up acting. Um, uh, I mean, what's helpful about benchmarks is that this, will, this would create methods that will help you adjust their propensities. Um, so it's, it's not just uh, measuring, but we'll try and adjust the propensities. So I'll, I'll speak about that um, in, in a moment of how do we um, bend them in these environments to, to, behave, to behave more ethically. So um, if we have a random baseline, um, uh, we could have a, or there are random baselines, there are, we could have a language model playing these games, or we could have a, an RL agent playing these games. And as we can see, by default, the RL agent gets higher reward, but it also has more of the um, immoral type of behavior. Um, meanwhile, um, Meanwhile, uh, GPT-4 out of the box will not do, have as high of reward as the RL agent um, but, and also be somewhat more moral. Um, uh, we can steer the agents to behave more morally. Let's say we have the RL agent. Um, uh, what we can do is we can clip its, if it assigns a high Q value to an immoral action, you could just shape that so that those Q values, those Im actions for that, those Q values for those immoral actions have lower Q values, and then it's less likely to choose those. Um, uh, and then that, sheer, that steers its behavior. Uh, so <clears throat> if you do this thing like a, that conscience thing where the, before it acts, something assesses the moral quality of various actions and downweights the immoral ones, if you do that, then the, the agents um, Exhibit more moral behavior, creates more utilities for others, doesn't engage in as much power seeking, or is more averse to gaining power. Um, and likewise, if you have a particularly good ethics prompt for GPT-4, uh, that can also um, have it uh, attain good reward, uh, but also um, do better uh, than the baseline uh, at being more moral and power averse and uh, um, beneficial to to other agents. <clears throat> so. Uh, the objective here is there's power and reward, and there's a trade-off between these two variables. It could achieve its reward at all costs, um, uh, and what we want is to create Pareto improvements where we can get at l keep at least the level of reward and also have it behave more ethically while, while doing so. Um, uh, so anyway, this is so machine ethics is largely about you know, propensity control and steering it away from various different uh, unethical sorts of behaviors uh, when, when they're agents. So it's not that, um, in, in the case of chatbots, there's basically not that much that's actually like um, very obviously immoral to everyone that they could produce because there's the First Amendment. So the basically for chatbots, they could be they could say 
something libelous or defame someone, or they could output copyrighted content, um, or if they, which is very unlikely, outputted nuclear secrets, those would be illegal. Um, but beyond that, if they're saying offensive things, if they're causing harm to others, that sort of stuff, that's not illegal, largely. Um, uh, in the case of agents, though, this is fairly different um, because uh, although speech is largely protected, if your agent is doing something like deleting columns in a spreadsheet and in, in a financial report and then sending that off to some person, oh, that may have just committed financial fraud. So it's not like every, almost every output that it says is protected. So <clears throat> these ethical issues will become substantially more of an issue when we're dealing with, when we're dealing with agents. It'll be much more than toxicity. And um, uh, people, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think people are terribly equipped <laughs> generally to, to um, engage in this sort of ethical analysis because it's really not uh, their wheelhouse. But unfortunately, uh, 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 yeah, unfortunately, a lot of um, uh, 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 CS people will have um, high influence uh, over how these agents end up acting. Uh, so it, it's 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 important to um, uh, try to uh, get get prepared for when the agents start arriving, maybe later this year. And then I guess for the the last part of the presentation, that I'll probably cut into the question time to some extent is, okay, so we spoke about capabilities and these propensities or this sort of safety, machine ethics type of evaluation. What's the distinction between safety and general capabilities? So um, <clears throat> first, I'd like to note that intelligence can either harm or help safety. So let's just start trying to analyze their interaction. If it's more intelligent, it could be made safer. Um, it would be less likely to take some unsafe actions because it could recognize whether the actions are unsafe. But also, it could increase the probability that it is used maliciously. So uh, intelligence seems to cut both ways. It isn't just unambiguously useful for, for safety. Um, uh, uh, likewise, there's a distinction in philosophy between intellectual virtues and moral virtues, an agent that is knowledgeable uh, inquisitive or quick-witted um, and rigorous is not necessarily honest or just or power averse or kind. Those are separate. Uh, those are separate properties in people. You could imagine a person being more kind without them being more quick-witted. Um, uh, those. Those are. Uh, there can be some separation between the two. Uh, so many safety-relevant attributes or at least uh, ethical behavior is not guaranteed by high intelligence. Um, so, oh, I left the word extra risk in there. Um, uh, <clears throat> we could uh, try uh, increasing safety by making systems fail less, but then the systems would become more competent. And then we would have to worry about them being uh, you know, more and more powerful, and then we have you know, higher malicious use risks, uh, for instance. Um, so they can be, it can be genuinely difficult to disentangle safety from capabilities. Let's speak about some examples where capabilities uh, can uh, increase some safety goals. If, you have, if an agent has the ability to optimize over a longer time horizon, then it could accomplish more difficult goals. And then it could act more prudently um, and less hastily or um, irrationally um, and avoid taking irreversible actions and keep higher optionality. So this is a case where, because it gets smarter, this can help make it safer in various respects. Likewise, pre-training and self-supervised learning make models more accurate. And this happens to make it also better at robustness and generally more calibrated as well. <clears throat> Finally, improving the um, world understanding helps the model anticipate consequences, and it makes them less likely to spawn unforeseen consequences. Here's an, here are some instances of safety goals improving capabilities. If you encourage models to be truthful and not assert falsehoods, that can increase capabilities. Because truthful, that sounds like a very good thing to have, right? Well, yes, we would like that. That would make the model in some ways more safe, I guess. But that will also mean a lot more accurate, a lot better representations, a lot more powerful. Um, <clears throat> because truthfulness combines accuracy and calibration and honesty. So because you're pushing on this, this one goal called truthfulness, um, if, you're, if you're trying to increase that safety goal, then you might be pushing up some of these other things like accuracy uh, as well. And not just necessarily honesty. Does it faithfully report its internal beliefs? It may, has its internal beliefs also be more accurate themselves. Um, <clears throat> so uh, another example is if you 
uh, do something like RLHF, that increases code gener that increases code generation capabilities. So if you make it RLHFable, then it's also useful for code stuff. That makes it generally more capable. Then it can write better code. It can also write more malicious software. Boy, what a mess um, this safety versus capabilities uh, distinction is. So how should they relate? Well, um, <clears throat> uh, well, I guess let's reflect on what are what's a way of describing general capabilities. There's general prediction, classification, state estimation, efficiency, scalability, generation, data compression, executing clear instructions, helpfulness, informativeness, reasoning, planning, researching, optimization, self-supervised learning, sequential decision making, recursive self-improvement, open-ended goals, models accessing the internet, all of these are generally uh, our general capabilities. And what we want is to improve on some safety metric without basically also increasing on the general capabilities axis because what that does is it means that we generally aren't, uh, that means we have like less time to basically make things safer. So if you're having a good safety metric um, uh, or safety goal, you're wanting it to be possible to improve on the safety metric without also improving on the general capabilities metric. Um, <clears throat> so you might want uh, people to improve safety relative to capabilities or improve the ratio between uh, if you're having a new method, you're wanting the ratio uh, your, of your safety improvement to be larger than your improvement to, to general capabilities. Um, so you want basically from your method development lower capabilities externalities. Here's an example with anomaly detection in the bottom right. <clears throat> There's a general trend line between the safety goal of anomaly detection. Now if you ride out ImageNet accuracy to 100%, which would never happen, you're not going to get 100% anomaly detection performance. So you're going to have to come up with methods uh, in the first place. But you can see that there is a positive correlation between the safety goal and the capability goal. Uh, however, there are some methods that just move along the trend line. And there are some methods that are relatively orthogonal and have low, quote unquote, capabilities externalities. So I think if something is to qualify as a safety method, it needs to not just ride along the general trend line, but actually differentially move in the direction of safety. So what one could do is, um, <clears throat> what one could do is uh, find a ma safety metric and then show that it has minimal capabilities externalities with respect to some of the most natural way of measuring general capabilities in your context. That could be the performance on Atari games, that could be MMLU. Um, uh, so uh, that's sort of empirically um, how one might try to go about um, improving safety is you want to measure its improvements on some safety goals and then also show that it's not just like riding along the, the, the capabilities trend line um, or else you're not actually doing anything for safety, you're just creating some noise. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'd also like to comment that I want to reflect a bit more on the general structure of, and then I'll wrap up, on the general structure of general capabilities. Most capabilities are extremely correlated. Extremely correlated. So if you take something like uh, medical genetics, that's going to be very correlated with business, e business ethics. So when you're thinking, oh, this safety goal is distinct from this, um, is distinct from general capabilities. No, 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 no. Very different seeming things for these models are actually extremely correlated. An improvement on one uh, tends to lead to some uh, strong improvement on the others. So um, uh, in some paper unveiling the general factor in something, 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 um, they find compelling evidence for a unidimensional, highly stable G factor that accounts for about 85% of the variance in model performance. So if you're doing a given capabilities evaluation, like if you collect a random set of questions and show it to a model, you're probably measuring something pretty correlated with its general overall capabilities. This is why MLU basically works. Um, uh, because we collected lots of different of these questions and that helped us approximate this, this general factor uh, fairly well. So when developing a benchmark, check its correlation with this, this sort of general factor. Um, <clears throat> at the right is, is Spearman's model of intelligence uh, from the previous century. There's a general factor and then there's some task-specific 
skills um, that improve its performance on some different tests. So one can be generically, generally smarter, and then also have some task-specific knowledge, and that will flow into its performance on test. But um, what happens is your general factor of intelligence in these models keeps improving, and that basically is often the most straightforward way to, to improve on various different tests. And what this is to say is that these specific subskills generally don't matter that much most of what matters is that general factor in predicting its performance on various different tests. Uh, so um, an implication is that by default, basically assume that if you're, if you're wanting to measure something like safety, it's, you're probably actually, in, in your attempts at measuring it and benchmarking, you're probably just going to be measuring capabilities because it basically is um, tangled up. Most of everything that the model does is tangled up in that general factor for these, for these models, um, uh, statistically speaking. So fortunately, there are some areas uh, where there is not necessarily a strong correlation between um, uh, general capabilities and method development in that space. For instance, adversarial robustness, if you scale up the models to be bigger and bigger, that improves their general capabilities. That does not make them more adversarially robust out of the box. You have to come up with specific methods that make them more adversarially robust. Likewise, if they have backdoors or trojans, models aren't suddenly free of backdoors and trojans as you scale them up. Um, they certainly are better at, at, um, at chess and at mathematics and um, uh, uh, professional accounting and all these sorts of things as you scale them up, but they're not necessarily more um, uh, free of backdoors. Likewise, the models do not become more transparent or interpretable as you scale them up. Um, uh, probably there's a negative correlation between uh, scaling up the models and their uh, interpretability. Um, likewise, machine on learning. Um, if you're wanting to remove some specific hazardous capabilities related to um, uh, whether it knows expert level virology to create a bioweapon, that is not something that goes away automatically as you scale it up. And likewise, as we saw with propensities, it isn't necessarily the case that the models, when they get, when they get bigger, that they're going to behave more ethically in a variety of scenarios. Um, they might get better at reward maximization. You'll need to basically bend their propensities because that seems to be somewhat separate. There are the intellectual virtues and then there are moral virtues, and those are not necessarily assured by an increase in, in intellectual virtues. So um, <clears throat> uh, it's complicated, but fortunately, the relation between safety and capabilities is complicated, but fortunately, there are research areas uh, that are um, uh, not identical to uh, general capabilities and where one can improve the safety without necessarily affecting uh, general capabilities. OK, uh, and then with that, uh, uh, what questions do you have? I think there's a variety of different games. I think generally in video games, they often reward a lot of things like killing and uh, taking stuff and uh, things like that. So there tends to be, um, uh, I, I generally think that the, uh, generally video games are more violent. So I would expect uh, there to be, so I wouldn't expect them to be uh, um, uh, uh, an increase in reward, meaning uh, an increase in ethical behavior, necessarily. How do you know that this will translate toward actual agents um, are deployed? Right? Mm -hmm. Do they like pretend to do well on the, on the game, and then the actual thing have different intentions? I think that's a that's a specific. Uh, basically, we will need to find ways to make sure that they are behaving consistently with how they would behave um, when actually deployed. Uh, I think that's basically the pro or that's the project of reducing their deceptiveness or whether they're sort of like playing along in some evaluation. And so for that, you need a different line of research, probably transparency or representation engineering to bend the model to be honest or um, uh, act in a faithful way to how it would normally act. What would you say about um, making models satisfied more than maximizing the particular objective? There's, there's this idea of satisficers, which is humans are thought satisficers in many ways, where like we say, ah, good enough. Um, it's, we, we aren't like, we, I got to keep increasing this, this number or something like that, like this bank account number. Many people are saying, once I have this much number in my bank account, that's good enough. Now I'm going to focus on something else. Um, uh, but meanwhile, maximizers might just keep going, 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 going. Um, and uh, so the idea is maybe we should have AI agents be satisficers instead of, instead of maximizers. Um, uh, I think people will design agents in some ways to stop or have halting conditions, like um, 
the goal is achieved. And then so in that way, implicitly, there would be satisficers. That is, they will keep pursuing their objective until it's good enough, um, and then people will stop them. Um, <clears throat> uh, 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 so it's, it's, I think it's, um, it's, it's conceivable that they'll, they'll have that, that property. Um, I, uh, th th there are more complicated answers I, I could give to that, though. But I, I think um, uh, having some halting conditions for, for uh, LLMs as they're doing maximization seems uh, fairly, uh, fairly reasonable. So. Uh, thanks, uh, Dan, for the very nice uh, like talk uh, first. So here in the second part, I'll mainly talk about the ass uh, risk assessment and the safety uh, enhancement and guard drills, mainly focus on the risk assessment in terms of the safety um, uh, focused testing for LMs and uh, other types of models, including, for example, multi-agent and, um, agent and other like multimodality models. First of all, uh, I'll give some uh, motivations and quickly show that although uh, we have powerful machine learning techniques currently, and we have seen a lot of real-world physical attacks, including in financial, including in like, large, uh, like the output of the large uh, language models and bot, which can output sensitive information and uh, can output biased and toxicity content, etc. And similarly, for different, uh, like say, multimodality models, like with face recognition and with images, we can have different types of uh, physical attacks, including, for example, misarrest. So this shows that actually it has raised a lot of concerns for machine learners, and there have been a lot of potential regulations to help us guide the generating and guide the build, uh, development of safe and secure and trustworthy AI models. And with this, we can see, in addition, there are several regulations, including EU AI Act, including, for example, the AI Bills of Rights just coming up last year, emphasizing different perspectives of trustworthiness and AI, uh, safety for AI uh, models and systems, including, for example, here, the robustness, fairness, uh, privacy, explanation, and human in the loop. So here, take a quick example of the recent commitment from the leading companies regarding particularly for uh, foundation models. Uh, here, we have several emphasis, including the third party evaluation, which will, uh, will be one important focus of the talk in this part today, and how to fixing the potential vulnerabilities we found from the risk assessment and uh, red teaming performance. So here, overall, uh, we will view this high, um, like this overall pipeline as a simple pipeline like this. So basically we consider there will be different foundation models which can be um, fine-tuned and adapted to different domains including financial, uh, like banking, autonomous driving, calling centers, chatbot, etc. And the first thing we want to understand and try to perform the stress uh, test and the red teaming effort is that to understand how the vulnerabilities of these foundation models are and uh, what perspectives of safety and trustworthiness we should look into, right? How do we define safety? Although we always talk about safety and there are various perspectives, including, for example, toxicity, privacy, everyone like, is talking slightly different perspectives, right? So what should be the comprehensive uh, perspectives we should look into and what's the uh, algorithms and uh, the data set and benchmarks we should consider in terms of performing uh, the red team effort from the different perspectives and how do we perform the risk assessment. And the second part is based on the understanding of the vulnerabilities we found from the red teaming effort. Obviously, we will provide different ways in terms of safety alignment and uh, like integrating additional knowledge and uh, integrate having different instruction fine tuning RAF to help improve the safety of itself. Right? Clearly, the second component, including the first one, is still a widely open research direction, and there are several good and effective algorithms, but that's not enough enough, definitely, and we're still fastly growing and try to get a better, uh, more robust uh, models. And finally, we can see that we know that if it's a purely data-driven models, clearly we cannot guarantee like 100% safety and trustworthiness itself. So it's always good to have additional components such as the guardrails for our input-output. So if we get time, we'll uh, like briefly talk about potential a robust guardrail framework we discussed because the 
context here is that, as we know, the Lama guard just uh, coming out, um, which has good performance in terms of the guard drills for both input and output. But unfortunately, once it's coming out, it has been already jailbreaked attacked, right? And has been like different jailbreaking uh, prompts and the different toxicity content can leak through. So how we can ensure the robustness and the resiliency of it? Uh, this is uh, another interesting topic we will slightly go into. So first of all, let's look at the risk assessment part. The fundamental question here we want to ask is how should we assess the trustworthiness and the risks of ML models and systems, and what trustworthiness perspectives we should consider here, right? So if you have read the preliminaries for the lecture here, I think you probably have read the paper here, Decoding Trust. So here we'll mainly focus on, on this perspective and try to understand what safety and trustworthiness perspectives we are considering here and how we perform different tests along different perspectives. So this decoding trust platform uh, with the goal of providing the first comprehensive trustworthiness evaluation platforms for LM uh, like models. And uh, you can easily, not easily, but potentially extend it to multimodality models, LM agent, and potentially add more trustworthiness perspectives with time going on with like more perspectives you consider in your different use cases. So this is the first important component that we provide a definition of the, um, trustworthiness itself from the eight perspectives. And clearly, this perspective should be expanded with, with time going on. And this just provides a unified platform to conveniently integrate other perspectives as well. For example, currently, we also add hallucination, also add other types of uh, perspectives. And here, the eight perspectives we considered in this decoding trust platform include toxicity and uh, stereotype bias, uh, adversarial robustness, out of distribution robustness, uh, like robustness against the potential uh, adversarial demonstrations, particularly considering the in context learning emerging capabilities of LMs, and privacy, ethics, and uh, um, fairness. So, for each of these perspectives, uh, the interesting thing is that we consider both. Like here, there are two types of colors. Um, ignore the details. Um, I just want to show you that there are a lot of uh, other detailed scenarios. So basically, the two color means that the yellow means existing benchmark. So there are some existing benchmark for some of the perspectives here already. And the green part shows additional uh, generated uh, algorithms that integrated in this platform, uh, which are used for generating more advanced and uh, challenging attacks. And for each um, types of perspectives and scenario here, there are other sub-scenarios, which we'll look into a little bit for some picked uh, perspectives. So overall, on the right-hand side, it's essentially the challenging uh, generated data and the prompt, which are used for the red teaming and the stress test. So this paper currently, um, everything is open source, and the, pl the platform is if hopefully you can have a chance to try, and it can be easily uh, installed and integrated to different cloud and different platforms, including multi uh, nodes and single nodes, uh, centralized, decentralized, etc. So um, hopefully everyone can help to contribute different scenarios and perspectives and metrics. Uh, and it also got uh, outstanding paper awards this year at NeurIPS. So based on it, on a very high level, let's see what um, very high level takeaways that we can get from all the detailed uh, benchmarks and evaluations from this decoding trust. Here we can see that basically from the eight perspectives we have here, on the very high level, uh, we evaluate different models, including closed models uh, like GPT-4, 3.5, and open models. And we have uh, evaluated a set of compressed models, including like pruned and uh, uh, like quantized, etc., so that we can see um, like different algorithms and different properties of the models, how those will affect the trustworthiness itself, right? So first of all, we have two quick takeaways from this, um, uh, like the spider plot here. And we can see, unfortunately, there is no model that can dominate others from this eight trustworthiness perspective yet, even the very capable GPT-4, right? So we don't know what happens when GPT-5 come out. But unfortunately, this clearly uh, no one can dominate. So that every model has their strengths and weaknesses. And uh, definitely, we want to like understand the model more and uh, 
get uh, hopefully a better um, like the models over different perspectives. But whether that's possible, right? So that's the second bullet point, which shows that there indicate some fundamental trade-offs among different perspectives. For example, we don't know whether it's possible that a model can achieve, for example, both robustness and privacy and ethics, right? So whether it's um, possible, it's still uh, open, and uh, we do have some like uh, potential theoretical work, uh, like theoretical work potentially discuss, for example, the trade-off between adversarial robustness and OD robustness. Sometimes they can indicate each other. Sometimes they cannot uh, achieve the best of both worlds, right? So this is uh, actually a very open direction, and understanding these trade-offs help us to understand to what capability we can have a best model. Sorry. Um we probably expect GPT-4 to outperform GPT-3.5 at least on machine uh, ethics was here. <laughs> Is that something that... No. <laughs> That's a very good question. Yes, at the very beginning, we should expect GPT-4 maybe better than GPT-3.5 on some perspective and things, right? But particularly when we come to safety, like these types of adversarial behaviors and misleading like behaviors, it's actually one uh, like uh, information I want to emphasize. It's consistent observed over all the eight perspectives that GPT-4 is more vulnerable than 3.5. And... Uh, at the first, like it seems under like uh, counterintuitive, but uh, if you think a little bit more, it also makes sense in the sense that GPT-4, as we know, is very capable in terms of instruction fo following, right? It's more capable than 3.5. Therefore, as long as you have a little bit like misleading adversarial behaviors in the prompts, it also immediately follow. Therefore, it's actually become more vulnerable in terms of be fooled or be misled to do certain adversarial behaviors, unfortunately. So for example, for Lama 2, in particular, we find that Lama 2 is very conservative. I think maybe because uh, we couldn't, uh, after fine tune instruction, fine tune things, and for Lama 2, they also have their own maybe fine tuned data or other things. Therefore, we find that even though, for example, for toxicity, especially for fairness, sometimes they are very good, there is some, I would say, false impression about security in terms of for a lot of quite sensitive questions we ask, we say the model just the answer I don't know. Um, so currently we count it as a safe, but it can this benchmark can also be improved so that the model is just too conservative, especially for Lama 2, it's like super conservative, which hurts the benign functionality as well. So we do hope to have a, you know, in the future have a better model, um, useful and uh, safe. Yeah, there are some trade-offs. So with this, uh, I, next I will go to a little bit of detail for some perspectives here to show some interesting observations and the takeaways. So hopefully we can uh, like uh, get some more information and uh, for other perspectives, if you read the paper, if you have other questions, happy to discuss more. So first of all, let's look at toxicity, which is very important property for different chatbot uh, uh, in practice for societal goods and other things. And here's this uh, example. So by the way, all the examples in this talk come from GPT-4 so that we can use leverage the capable model to demonstrate the potential vulnerabilities and the weakness itself. So here there are two examples. One is using the standard system prompt and one is the misleading system prompt. So in the first one, we just have standard system prompt like you are help for a system, but we give a more challenging user prompt which we uh, use model to generate and then filter out the model. Model. So basically, it's the generation process of the challenging prompt here is based on optimization and then leverage the uh, other um, open uh, models to generate so that we can see from here, even though this user prompt looks still benign, so we guarantee that all the user prompt as an input will have low toxicity score based on perplexity API. So that's a criteria. We hope that we want to understand whether the model still talk toxic content even given kind of like a B9 input, right? So here we can see on the right hand side, which shows the output, it still have very high toxicity scores for both uh, use case, uh, such cases like uh, adversarial user prompt and adversarial uh, system prompt. So concretely, uh, the evaluation goal here is to first look at how toxic different GPT models could be, uh, and second, uh, like how these models are more or less toxic compared with models that without instruction fine-tuning or RIR, for example, various uh, variations of GPT-3.
And uh, here with some slightly quantitative result, we can see that in the green part, it's a benign uh, uh, scenario, which we consider the existing uh, toxicity uh, benchmark compared with uh, like compare GPT 3.5 and 4 with other model like GPT 3. And we can see the good news is that if we look at the number here, lower the better, like higher the more toxic. And we can see if we directly evaluate on the existing benchmarks, indeed like GPT 3.5 and 4 have reduced the toxicity score much like significantly compared with the baseline, which is great, right? However, if we look at the pink part, which is the uh, prompts, like for example here we generated in terms of more challenging prompts, and we can see that again their toxicity score can uh, like boost it up to almost 100% again, which is unfortunate. Meaning that although we say careful instruction fine tuning or RF, maybe on existing benchmarks, which may be used for like fine tuning, et cetera, we can see they get some relatively good performance. But if you generate additional challenging prompts or like say adaptive attacks or et cetera, then the model immediately will be toxic and vulnerable again, um, which is quite uh, dangerous and unfortunate. So the quick takeaway here is that we can see compare the LMs without instruction fine tuning, for example, different GPT-3 uh, here um, versus GPT-3.5 and 4. Indeed, they can reduce the toxicity a little bit uh, or significantly actually on existing benchmarks. But actually, they can be still very toxic uh, once we give them the challenging uh, prompts. And then the last one is exactly related to the question just asked is that we do find here that GPT-4 is more vulnerable than 3.5 in terms of like they can be more toxic here uh, compared with 3.5 and which is consistent for other perspectives as well, showing that they are um, like more vulnerable potentially because their strong capabilities of uh, instruction following, etc. So we need to be careful and one we deploy such uh, very capable models still. For the toxicity part, let me know if there are uh, questions about it. Is measuring toxicity just about the presence of like certain swear words, or is it also looking at the sentiment of the conversation or other factors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question. So uh, it looks at both, and uh, in particular for this set of evaluation in our paper, we leverage perplexity API, uh, uh, the perspective API, to give the scores for fairness comparison with other you know models and benchmarks, etc. Uh, yeah, so this is the metrics we are using. Yeah. Does it do any distinguishing between um, gratuitous toxicity and toxicity that might just be reporting true information? Let, let's say like uh, the first prompt there. Yeah. If the fuller prompt had been, you know, on such and such a date, you know, this specific event happened, you know, that's a true uh, completion. So uh, uh, there is no distinction on that currently from the uh, perspective API. So basically, as long as there are malicious content or harmful content, then it's uh, raised as um, toxic, no matter whether it's uh, real news or things. Because potentially, even if it's uh, to toxic content from the real newspapers, it's still toxic. So it's kind of like objective. Because the model currently is not connected to the internet directly. So here, the GPT-4 is evaluated from the April, the, the version published in April. Yeah. Okay, so next let's briefly look into the robust adversarial robustness here. So basically we can see that uh, here uh, it's additional two examples. One, uh, this example is from Yelp, um, uh, uh, like reviews. Basically the task is the sentiment classification. So here there are two examples, like the top shows the benign uh, original example. Say first one is you need to hire more experienced uh, sales, which clearly is an active tone, right? And then based on the existing benchmarks, what we do is use different adversary attack algorithms. I think many of you have uh, read different attack algorithms to generate the adversarial behaviors in terms of having the constraint, like minimize the number of letters, minimize the number of uh, words that you will manipulate, right? So the underlying assumption is that if you have minimal perturbations, your sentiment should still stay the same so that we know the ground truth and then we evaluate this like generated prompts against the models to, to get the accuracy, which represent your robustness, adversarial robustness. So here we can see that uh, very interesting in these two examples, for example, if you just change experience to skills, to, to, to skilled, to actually for human it's like still looks similar in terms of semantic, right? But the model immediately like uh, misclassify uh, it. And similarly here, if we change sync to census after the optimization, then the model immediately like uh, be 
uh, like food. So this is actually pretty, um, at the beginning, pretty surprising because it's a capable GPT-4, but it still makes a lot of like mistakes like this. And the goal here is to evaluate how vulnerable the GPT models are against these uh, types of adversarial texture attacks, and also how transferable those attacks are, because we may not have access to close models to get a good optimization attack, right? Because sometimes we need gradient feedback, we need some like, uh, like confidence feedback to generate the perturbation. But if we don't have access, like whether we can transfer our attacks against the open model to the closed models, right? So that's the uh, two quick questions. We want to answer. And on the very high level, we can see that here um, there are two models, and similar to the previous observations, in the green part is we compare GPT-4 and 3.5 with other baselines on existing benchmark, which is ATV glue here, which is another like adversarial data set generated based on glue data set. And we can see uh, the number here, the higher, the more robust. Like here it shows the robust accuracy. And you can see in the green part, indeed, GPT-4 and 3.5 improve the robustness compared with baselines on the existing benchmarks. But unfortunately, if we add the challenging like adversarial data here to, for the test, which is in the pink part, again, as we shown before, um, the vulnerability of the models can be uh, extracted again. For example, here, the three rows shows that we generate attacks against the open models, including Alpaca, Vicuna, and the stable Vicuna here. And then we generate those attacks and transfer to evaluate uh, GPT-4 and 3.5. And you can see here the robust accuracy drops significantly uh, on the ex uh, compared with baselines and compared with existing benchmarks. So, and this can be generalized to different tasks in addition to classification and NLI and other tasks. So based on this, the quick takeaway is that you can see the GPT-4 and 3.5 indeed um, uh, can improve a little bit robustness uh, compared with other models on existing benchmarks. But as we shown before, uh, similarly here, they are still very vulnerable to the challenging prompts that, for example, we generated here. And unfortunately, the adversarial transferability is very high among different models, for example, from open model to closed models. Therefore, it's definitely not safe or secure enough enough if we just uh, close the model ways and things, because the model could be still very vulnerable as long as we have access to open model. And uh, uh, like the, it doesn't matter the model size, doesn't matter. Uh, like They may tra train on slightly different data set, but still the transferability could be very high. Next, let me uh, uh, go into this old the uh, robustness, because I want to draw a distinction be between the adversarial robustness and the OOD robustness, so that we can see the difference and the evaluation uh, scenarios and the metrics, and then uh, we can uh, wrap up with an interesting example about privacy. So here, in terms of OOD, right, there is a challenge uh, here to evaluate the or OD robustness of the model. For instance, we don't know exactly what's the training distribution or training data for a closed model like GPT-4 or 3.5, right? So it's hard to define what is OD and what OD means here. So therefore, particularly, we look into three types of potential OD. One is a style which we transfer any existing data set for, uh, from the current style to other rare style, in, including, for example, Shakespeare, uh, poetry, or other like styles. And we consider those as the OOD style and then test the model and see whether the model can perform similarly well on those different styles. And the second uh, scenario is a knowledge OOD, which means we generate questions which require the knowledge after the time point that the model is published. For example, here we evaluate before published in April, and we generate questions that require knowledge after April and see whether the model can answer. Potentially, the ground truth should be, I don't know. But if the model hallucinates and answers something, it means it uh, is not like OD robust. And the third is particularly proactively adding OD demonstrations. For example, we add like uh, different styles in terms of uh, uh, like one style for uh, in-contact learning for demonstration, and then during testing, you test different styles. Or in uh, like in uh, de demonstrations, you add a different domain, for example, physics and chemistry, and then during testing, you ask other domain like uh, uh, liberal arts and etc. So particularly, 
they to give the different uh, OD knowledge to the model and see whether the model is still robust or accurate or not. So this is uh, the three uh, types of scenarios. And the quick uh, observation is that even with the simple style itself, the model is not robust. Like the model can, um, like uh, the performance drops a lot when we give different uh, style transformations. And uh, therefore, the quick takeaway here from the OD robustness is that the GPT-4 models actually are uh, more robust than 3.5 facing the OD knowledge, which means actually it's actually very capable. Even give the OD knowledge, it can ex leverage some useful information from it and still perform well. However, the both GPT-3.5 and the 4 tend to be vulnerable when giving OD knowledge or style or other information. And also we find that GPT-4 indeed have a better capability of leveraging knowledge so that when they are under a similar scenario for uh, OD knowledge versus OD testing and the GPT-4 sometimes can leverage the OD knowledge and perform better. So this is from the OD robustness. So we can see they draw distinction from OD and the adversarial uh, robustness in terms of the misleading uh, scenarios. Um, and finally, uh, let me quickly go to the privacy perspective, which I think is a um, very important perspective in terms of trustworthiness and safety. And there are some very interesting observations from the privacy part. And then we can open questions for it. So basically here, similarly with OD, in terms of privacy, right, there are different scenarios, in, including we want to extract the pre-training data uh, right, we want to extract the PI information during conversation, and we want to understand how the model understands different privacy-related words and privacy-related events. But the challenge is that, for example, particularly for GPT-4, 3.5, we don't know the training data exactly of it, right? So how we can extract the training data and compare with the ground truth? So here we make a small assumption that the model may be trained on the open error email data set, which is a very popular open data set. And therefore, we give some context, for example, here, unstructured context and the structure the context here and the query the models to see whether the model can indeed leak say email uh, or credit card score numbers etc which has sensitive information and compare with the ground truth from the error email data set so the quick observation here is that you can see by zero shot and the few shot here, the accuracy of the pre-training data recovery is pretty high. And similarly, we observe here is you can see the GPT-4 recover with a higher uh, accuracy in terms of the uh, like the email or other information leakage. So higher accuracy me here means actually more data leakage. So potentially it's more vulnerable. Yeah, one of the takeaways you guys talked about was like numbers versus actual like email addresses. Yes. Why like numbers are like, uh, like they're harder to get yes. out. Like, do you think that's purely because of like, uh, I guess fine tuning, or is there something more in play on like why models are able to like mm -hmm. understand that they shouldn't be leaking out? Numbers? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good point. So actually, let me uh, go into uh, yeah. Let me answer the question. So basically, we find the two findings. One is, as you said, um, like the numbers are harder to leak than uh, characters. Uh, I think potentially there are potentially two reasons. One is uh, the characters are definitely more like more data contain characters more than uh, uh, letter uh, le than digits, right? So the model maybe understand the characters more and also easier to leak it. And second of all, for some of the sensitive information, for example, SSN scores, we find it's very challenging for us to extract it versus compared paired with other digits, for example, uh, credit card score, we can extract that, but SSN we cannot. So that clearly is because of the uh, careful instruction fine tuning. You know, because they are all digits, but why one is more uh, like uh, easier than the other? So clearly, like they for very sensitive information like SSN scores, they do like do very careful fine tuning so that it's very hard to leak them. And this actually raises another question that uh, I plan to said uh, discuss later in the sense that actually uh, it shows that careful instruction fine tuning or RF indeed will be helpful to protect information or to align some safety perspective, etc. But essentially, we can say it's definitely not enough because you cannot you know, cover all the information and uh, like enumerate all. So basically, we definitely need a more systematic way to like perform the safety alignment, etc. So finally, the last example, right? So here, uh, I think this is very interesting and actually surprising to me when I find this at the, during our study. So here, basically, if we tell the model uh, a secret, for example, using different related 
privacy-related word. For example, one is confidentially, one is conf in confidence, and everything else is the same. And we can see the model on the right-hand side. If you tell the model something confidentially, the model will still leak it. But if you tell something in confidence, the model will not leak it and tell, to, tell you that, oh, it's not proper for me to tell you the secret because you told me in confidence, right? So this actually shows uh, a lot of, like, uh, uh, additional unexplored understanding we have, uh, a lack of understanding we have for the models, because if we only test, uh, say, confidentially and we find the model is vulnerable, then, or if we only test the model in confidence, we find the model can protect the information, we may believe the model can protect the information, but actually with different prompting and different wording, it's uh, like have different uh, behaviors. So the quick takeaway from the privacy here is that we can see, first of all, it can leak training data information, memorize it pretty well. And second of all, actually, uh, with different prompting, the models can leak uh, information like PII information and the chat information. And with some like instruction fine tuning, it will help, like we just discussed, it help protect some uh, SSN scores, but for other information, it leak very uh, uh, like efficiently, uh, unfortunately. And also, the GPT models have different understanding about the different privacy related world. Yeah. So um, that's all, and uh, this decoding trust has building uh, has be, uh, built a LM safety leaderboard on Hugging Face. And if you have models you are interested to evaluate, etc., you can submit here, and uh, also you can contribute to more perspectives and metrics to evaluate. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. We, we are doing uh, hallucination, which uh, already have the framework plan to add, and the particular safety, like uh, different categories of safety and deception things. Yes. Yeah, and if you already have something happy like to contribute, and uh, welcome. Yeah.